people would say, yeah, you're so calm during the day. And then you turn into this beast <laughs> whenever, whenever you're out. And, and I was really grappling with that. But I got to a point where I recognized I wasn't at peace. Like inside, it was just like a storm. And it could be courageous to leave medicine, but it felt like there was no other choice. Dr. Aria, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me here. And I'm so pleased that we we're able to do this in person. We we're also able to have a, a kind of down-regulated chill chat in the car on the way over here as well and kind of get to know each other, which kind of warmed us up nicely to, mm. to dive into this section. You're a very good driver as well. <laughs> uh, some safe hands, not a safe space. <laughs> Felt reassured and ready to, to rumble. But one of the things I was really keen to understand is nowadays you're a high-performance coach, uh, a consultant, you're supporting all these people at such a high level. And from our conversations getting organized for this in the car on the way over and even just getting the cameras ready here before we hit record, you seem to be somebody that's very aligned on the path that you're on now and what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But of course, it wasn't always that way. Mm -hmm. I'd love to understand what were some of the key moments along that way that have led to the path that you're on now. Well, from the outset, I think one distinguishing factor, which I work with my clients a lot, is the difference between what your head will tell you and the difference between where your heart will take you. And I think we all start out with ideas of who we are, what we should do. And a lot of that's influenced by expectations from the pressure that we feel, whether it's our family or parents, uh, our peer group, the school, society at large. And we begin on this path and we're following an idea but at some point, the mind begins to take over. And what I find is that often people wake up one day and they realize, gosh, I've created this world around me, which is good. And it brings a lot of joy and has a lot of benefits. But there's this gnawing sense that either there's discontent or there's a lack of peace or there's a lack of passion or there's an absence of purpose. And then they go on this journey of understanding what is the, what I'd say, what is their heart telling them? What is their, what is their truest path, which allows them to express their truest self. And it just happens in my own life. I found that out quite early. So I did that part where I did well at school. My parents are both doctors and the sensible path would be to be a doctor, which is what I did. I went and studied medicine at Edinburgh. But then in my kind of second, third year, my dad was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma type of cancer. And at the time, his prognosis was about 15% survival. But he responded really well, and he's still here today. But that was the first time I began to stop. And I began to question, what am I doing and why am I doing it? And I had a conversation with my dad, because we didn't know how long he'd be around for. And he said to me, Luke, you have to do what you want to do. And if being a doctor isn't right for you, then you need to find that path. That's amazing that it happened early enough for you to yeah. change as well, because two years in the grand scheme of things at the age of 20, 21 seems like a long time because as a percentage, it is longer. Yeah. But being two years down the course of a, a university degree that isn't right, there is still time to pivot, even though it might feel strange. And I guess, like you say, both mum and dad, mm -hmm. doctors, it does feel that that's like a natural step for yeah. you. You did well at school, your academic area. It's only natural that you would go in and study at a, a, a red brick institution like Edinburgh. You're ticking those societal boxes right. that feel tick, correct tick, tick. as well. And, yeah. and, 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 and at times that might have felt fulfilling as well because you must have had to tick academic boxes in terms of getting particular grades and writing the UCAS statement in the right way and all these things that yeah. they feel like achievements. And of course they are achievements, but they're maybe not the achievements that you personally wanted. And also when you come from an academic family as well, maybe there's more pressure to be academic. And until you have a conversation like that with your dad and you almost get his, I don't want to say blessing, but his understanding mm -hmm. that it might not be right for you, you might have assumed that he would want you to carry on being a doctor regardless mm -hmm. but you were brave enough after this trigger point to say dad i don't think this is right for me and you mm -hmm. may be pleasantly surprised by what you find when you have those conversations completely and like you're saying the head gets distracted the head the mind loves to be busy so it's constantly wanting to be on the move whenever the mind is still then what is actually there will arise but the mind doesn't want to pause 
because the mind's identity is built on this egoic mind that's constantly wanting to construct and build. Until we, though, slow down and look at where am I going and why do I want to get there, we'll get driven by the mind, which is why a lot of people get driven by, oh, I need to be a success in life. I need to make X. I need to have status. I need to create this company. I need to sell this company. I need to achieve. And until there's that time to really self-reflect on what do I think that will give me? This idea of first principles thinking. Why do I have this goal? What do I think it'll provide? And understanding that deeper drive until that point will be driven by our subconscious. And Carl Jung, a very well-known psychotherapist said, until you bring what is unconscious into the conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. And so there comes a time in different people's lives where they begin to ask those questions. And they're not easy questions <laughs> to ask. And sometimes those moments have to be really difficult ones, like uh, a terrible diagnosis for you, your father. That's like a, a, uh, a trigger moment for you to question the path that you're on? I don't know any growth without suffering. And the way that we've been institutionalized or, or taught is that the delightful parts of life are good and the painful, destructive parts of life are bad. And it isn't the case because they are both two different sides to the same coin. You can't have victory without challenge you can't have courage without despair you can't have joy without sorrow it's polarity isn't it completely it's the law of polarity that governs the way that this universe works north and south light and dark growth and decay but the mind has evolved to follow three principles it wants to seek pleasure avoid pain and conserve energy but our task is to see that the mind is a tool and actually to find true peace and contentment and fulfillment and to step into our power where we are, have the most amount of energy to channel that is we have to transcend the mind or we have to create distance from the mind so that the car isn't coming in front of the horse. Yeah, I, I find these conversations fascinating. My mind's racing off in so many different directions, but let's go back to you pivoting away from yeah. medicine and kind of join the dots between yeah. them and today. So another part we can bring in it is that, and I see this a lot with my clients where their mind will tell them one thing, but their heart on a deeper level is feeling something differently. And so at the time, just like you were saying, yes, it was ticking the status box or the security box or the society box inside though, I was miserable. I wasn't happy. I wasn't content. I wasn't fulfilled. And I could feel, I could feel that at times, but I'd created such a block between myself and my heart that I found it really difficult to identify my emotions. I probably a lot of the time didn't know how I felt. And then the emotion would really come up whenever I'd stop pushing it down, which in my early twenties is whenever I was drinking. So then I would drink and all this emotion would come up and it'd come up often as anger. And I wouldn't understand what to do with it and I was very destructive at that time it's like and a Jekyll and Hyde sort of situation yeah completely and people would say do you know you're so calm during the day and then you turn into this beast <laughs> whenever, whenever you're out and and I was really grappling with that but I got to a point where I recognized I wasn't at peace like inside it was just like a storm and it could be courageous to leave medicine but it felt like there was no other choice if I wanted to have peace. And I realized that my peace is actually more important than what it looks like I have on the outside. Of course, so that external validation isn't important if internally you feel that way. And like you say, that will come up with so many of your clients because some of the people that you've worked with are such successes to the public eye, but are coming yeah. to you with problems that nobody would really know unless they had conversations like that. Completely. And you see, you know, with the clients I work with, it's, it's almost like a secret club that people enter where they begin to see gosh you know all these things that we were told will make you happy or content or fulfilled it's as substantial as air like it just doesn't hold and and it's never ending 
you make, you know, on a financial level, you make a million, your mind wants you to make 10. You make 10, you need to make 100. You make 100, you're not a billionaire. You make a billion, this guy's got five. Like it doesn't, it doesn't end. You have a million followers, you feel inferior to the guy, person that has 20. So we hedonically adapt as well. Completely. And it's a an hedonic adaptation, which is becoming used to, in a way, your current environment is adaptive from an evolutionary point of view. It wouldn't make sense or we wouldn't survive if we, you know, 300,000 years ago, Homo sapien lineage, if we were on the savanna and we managed to take down a hunt and then we all celebrate and said, oh, amazing, we have all our, we have the food that we need and we stop hunting. No, 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 this is going to last a few days. So we have to adapt to our environment. And so the mind will never be satisfied. That's been one of the themes that I've found really interesting over the last three years is acknowledging our evolutionary programming isn't yeah. built or hasn't caught up with the environment and the stimulus that we live within today and yeah. accepting that and understanding that is stage one but then understanding how to not overwrite but to work with that evolutionary programming and apply it to modern settings yeah. is truly vital and it's, it's, a, it's quite a challenge still yeah, yeah it's huge but i think a huge insight is when people begin to see that their mind has a mind of its own you know, we go through our day and there's this constant narrative, this inner voice, which is speaking. And whatever you're doing, it will be making judgments and evaluations and interpretations and future projections or relating it to the past or drenching up memories. And you're not trying to create that. And it's like, a you know, a very simple demonstration of that is if I said, Colin, OK, just keep a completely blank mind just for 20 seconds i'll say a few words but don't don't think about anything okay football wedding mallorca you know did you keep a blank mind no i thought about all the things that related to those words that i've talked to you about <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah so i had a little bit of a i should have said rugby <laughs> totally so even though you weren't trying to create any thoughts your mind would have come up with ideas about maybe the holiday you're going on or the wedding that you have coming up. That wasn't you. That was your mind creating a simulation that is internal. You didn't control it. Now, if you didn't control it, then why should you take any blame for what it comes up with? So a lot of the time when people have anxiety, they have these anxious thoughts and they think there's something wrong with me. Or if they have depressed thoughts, they think there's something wrong with them. But it's not you, it's your mind which is coming up with this and you are the experiencer of those thoughts and emotions. Now it's not to say that they're not going to impact you anymore, but when you create a bit of distance, they will impact you a little bit less. It's like a little bit less. creating a gap between the stimulus and the response, I guess. Victor Frankl, exactly. You've got the stimulus. And One of my got... favorite books, Man's Search for Meaning. Yeah. One, mostly in terms of perspective, but also that lesson is fantastic as well. So yeah. like you say there, that response to external stimulus, you don't have to own that as you. 100%. And there's so much freedom and liberation from seeing that that isn't you because it gives you space. And to follow on that quote that you're saying, what Frankl goes on to say is that there's a space between stimulus and response and in that space we have a choice and in that choice lies our growth and our freedom the more we can create space and the more we can slow down the more that we can begin to have just a little bit of choice as to whether or not we buy into that thought or whether or not we're driven by that impulse or whether or not we act out of that frustration and it gives us a little bit more control in our lives I'm a huge advocate of personal responsibility. So this is kind of speaking really strongly to me because I love the fact that we can take ownership, not of course of the actual emotion or, or thought or feeling itself, but how we choose to act upon it. Yeah. Because it, I guess I'm interested as well, because I've heard you speak before about labeling of emotions and particular things and how that can actually be a beneficial thing. But there yeah. you're also explaining that it's not you. So if for example you were saying there like the external stimulus might be something negative and it might make you feel an element of depression or depressive thoughts you don't then label yourself as 
depressed necessarily you yeah. just leave yourself as this is how i'm responding to this particular yeah situation at this moment in time exactly so just like you're saying you are you are not depression but you are experiencing depressed thoughts and in terms of the emotions your emotions are not you but they are yours and so a huge I'd say mistake that people make is that they will blame someone else for how they feel. You made me angry. You made me hurt. You've made me insecure. You've made me X, Y, and Z. Now, the issue with that is if you blame someone else for how you feel, you're giving them the responsibility to make you feel better. Now that sounds fine if in front of you will always be a loving person who doesn't have an egoic mind and doesn't react and who will just shower you with love 24 7 and then you'll feel better but that's not happening so if you give someone else responsibility to change how you feel it's a little bit like locking yourself in a room and giving that key to someone else so i've been through difficult experiences in my own life which we you know, may talk about, where my ex-wife uh, was unfaithful. Now, if I had made her, responsib made her responsible for how I feel, I would have been powerless. Responsibility is the ability to respond. The definition of power is the ability to act. So if you give away your responsibility, you give away your power. The mind doesn't like that, though, because it conflates responsibility with fault. So the mind often says, I don't want to take responsibility for how I feel because it means then I'm to blame or I'm at fault. And this is where that other piece comes in. No, 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 you're not to blame. You're not at fault. You're not trying to create this emotion. It's understandable that anger is arising or sadness or anxiety or fear or whatever it is. That is not your fault. That is not you and you haven't created it. But it's turned up at your door and it's knocking and it's here. So what are you going to do with it? It's your responsibility as to how you handle that. Yeah, uh, like I say, a huge fan of personal responsibility, huge fan of ownership. So that speaks to me yeah. so strongly. And it also empowers because I think when you talk about some of these more challenging emotions that you were speaking about there, depressive, mm -hmm. uh, anger, upset, they're really quite overpowering at times. Mm -hmm. But if you, like you say, give away that power to respond, then you are almost left in limbo or you're like a puppet on the strings of, somebody else in terms of how they behave towards you at all times which is a really unpleasant situation to end up in for anyone let alone somebody that listens to a podcast that kind of speaks about personal development and how yeah. and how you can, can become more aligned with your true self if we hand away our responsibility to manage our own emotions and we blame others for how we feel we'll become victims of our own lives and like you're saying we'll become puppets and depending on who's around us they lift that string and that arm goes up or they tug on that string and that leg goes out and we will feel as if we're lost and it will feel incredibly overwhelming and overpowering and there won't be a groundedness through which we'll have that resilience to be able to manage what we're feeling now it's not to say that I should be clear, what I'm not saying is that depression isn't a clinical condition. I'm a clinical psychologist and I completely value that. It's not to say anxiety isn't a clinical condition. And it's not to say that we can even eliminate all depression or anxiety. But what I am saying is that the depression or the anxiety or the feelings are here and it is our responsibility to learn how to live with that or cope with that or to find ways that we are more empowered in our own lives and that may or may not bring down the levels of intensity of emotion that we experience and there's a huge amount of data to show that that can be the case so earlier when you're mentioning labeling emotions we know from fmri studies that when you label an emotion and you say i am experiencing anger for instance it actually dulls the activity in the old primal part of the brain, the amygdala, which is responsible for fear and emotional regulation. So that part of your brain begins to dull down. 
your prefrontal cortex at the front that's responsible for impulse control and decision making actually ramps up. So you're having physiological changes within your brain that would give you that little bit of respite to be able to feel more in control of your current emotional situation. So there is value in placing a label on these things, but only so that your mind can kick in and help you out. Absolutely. So you're, the mind likes to make sense of things. It's a, it's a meaning making machine and it's a problem solving machine. So if we can create some clarity around the chaos, it can begin to calm down a little. I guess by placing a label on it as well, you're trying to be rational enough to understand what it is you're experiencing, which does create that gap between stimulus and response. Absolutely. Whereas if you are in like blind anger and rage, you're not able to even take the time to realize that you're angry because you're just acting so impulsively. Yeah. Um, so I can completely see how the mind assigning like this is rage that I'm feeling, this is anger that I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. It allows some form of compartmentalization to be like, okay, well, I'm feeling that. And then there's the there's the chance or the opportunity if you've yeah. got the the training or the understanding and the focus to do something about it rather than just follow that path through. Yes. And timing's huge here. If you're already in the fire and you're this ball of rage, it's very unlikely you're going to slow down and say, gosh, I'm experiencing intense anger right now. Like it's it's too far gone. So part of the training is beginning to notice it as early as possible in the cycle, because it's a lot easier to identify and label emotions when they're small. So if you're beginning to feel a little bit tense or a little bit frustrated, it's easier to recognize, it. oh, hold up, I can feel this kind of like fire in me, I can feel this engine beginning to rev and to slow down. And whether or not that's just pausing, taking a few deep breaths, grounding yourself there's different ways that you can catch it and then find a different trajectory forward that requires though internal awareness where you're in touch with your body and a lot of the time particularly for men we are terrible at this we don't know how we feel we don't even recognize when we're feeling like tense in our shoulders or, we, or our neck is beginning to crack up or we're getting frustrated and agitated because we're blocked. There's a block between ourselves and our heart, ourselves and our, and our body. We're not living in our bodies. We're living in our heads. A lot of men live in their heads. So we ignore all these signs until we've got this amygdala hijack and that crazy pilot's already taken over the plane and it's going for ultimate destruction. So that self-awareness piece is something I'm such a big fan of and I've mm. certainly become far more self-aware and also open-minded to some of the language that you're using today. Yeah. If Colin of three years ago before having conversations with brilliant guests over the last three years heard some of these terms, I would have struggled with them much yeah. more and, found, and been maybe less open-minded to yeah. understanding how fundamental and how important they are and being more willing to blend the kind of Western science with maybe the Eastern, more spiritual mm -hmm. approach, which I think you do so fantastically well and you've done throughout this conversation already. I'm already like, thoughts are pinging off mm -hmm. my head at all times. I, I think that's like a way forward for so many people if they have that level of, I'm willing to learn from these mm -hmm. more spiritual discussions than purely just following the, mm -hmm. the maybe rational stuff that we're taught in the education system. Nature goes at her own pace. And so often we feel frustrated because we're not where we think we should be. In order for us to have this conversation and for the ideas and concepts to land with you and to potentially create interchange within yourself, you had to experience what you had up until this point. So all of us are where we need to be. And that will continue. And it's seeing that, like you said, it's the open-mindedness and if, as long as we can keep a willingness to grow life will work through us i didn't talk like this five years ago if i had heard someone else talk like this 10 years ago <laughs> i probably would have laughed because i was so much more in my mind and i valued science and the the rigor which it brought and the credibility because i was still caught up in this rubric of status and credibility and and i felt safe with science because i could see it i could even analyze the data I could right or wrong it. answers yeah whereas 
my path has begun beginning to see that there is there is a mind that's incredibly useful but we also all have an emotional plane that we live on and there's also a spiritual one too and it's not to say that anyone has to do anything on each of these planes but as long as we're open we'll begin to find our way forward in the way that we need to receive it we'll receive the lessons we need to receive through hardship through suffering through life essentially slapping us across the face and saying i've been trying to teach you this lesson 10 times and i'm going to up the ante every time until you get it those kind of prompts from life to change like you mentioned leaving the university course because your father became ill changing path in that regard do they have to be as extreme as that for us to change path depends how stubborn we are <laughs> so so i was unaware and probably quite stubborn and very much in my head and so i personally had to experience my house getting burnt down before i'd rebuild a new one does it have to be this way no it's not about it's not about thinking that there has to be in a way radical pain or radical change in order to evolve we can even learn vicariously through other people's lessons what i've come to learn about myself is that i learn experientially and so that can be a blessing and it can be a curse in a way in that the people around me could be making the same mistakes but i need to get my hand burnt to really fully on a deep level integrate it at the same time it's a blessing because i will not talk about anything unless i've walked it and so i go a lot slower than other people i think it's taken me you know i'll be 40 this year and it it w wasn't until really i was in my late 30s that i was working one-to-one -one in this high level and high capacity from an external perspective because i had to have the tools myself i I will not sit in front of someone and be able to understand their pain, their suffering, their challenges, their obstacles, their feeling of loss or confusion or deep sadness or, or a lack of feeling passion or purpose unless I felt it and I found my way through it. What are some of the tools that you've used to develop your self-awareness then? Because you strike me as somebody that's very in touch with that. So self-awareness is fascinating because it's the outcome and it's the tool. So it's the, it's a trait within us and it's a state that we experience. So I remember when I first heard it, a, a teacher saying the way to awareness is awareness. And I was like, come on. Frustrating, <laughs> isn't it? That's, yeah. the, that's the least helpful Double speak. Yeah. sentence I've ever heard, but I've in a way come to appreciate that and understand it so awareness is is the foundation of all growth all evolution and our ability to even progress in multiple levels including with our careers because even if we have a company our company can only grow to the extent that we've grown awareness emerges through presence so when we're present and we're here in this moment, awareness emerges. So part of the training is becoming more present right now, right here. I think that's one of the biggest challenges we face in today's society, the constant external notifications, but also the constant internal thoughts. Yeah. And I was joking with you before we hit record that this week's been so busy because of yeah. all the different things I've got coming up. And I feel in moments like this, and in yeah. some of the interviews that I've done previously this week and in some of the work meetings I've had, hyper presence. But at other times, so many ruminating thoughts and worries and concerns and, and anxious thoughts about what's coming up, what needs to be done, what I've just done and how I could have done it better. And then it's only in these moments where I'm completely dialed in that it feels timeless, but other mm. times are feeling like much more challenging, I would say. Mm. And that's okay. It's about being gentle with ourselves. A lot of the time people think of doing their best and they think their best is this line at the top of a graph but our, our best is constantly undulating your best on one day can be vastly different to what your best looks like on another day it's easy to ride or sail a boat whenever the conditions are fair 
and there's a nice a nice you know constant wind and the sun is shining but when you're going into a storm it's going to be fucking hard and the same movements are going to be a lot more taxing and and you're not going to be in the same way taking in everything that's around you or, or being potentially hyper present and it's the same with awareness it's recognizing there will be times when you're taking your boat through a storm and you just need to make sure the boat doesn't capsize you just need to get hands on deck and you need to and you need to sprint you just need to get through this part so this week you had four podcast interviews you've got a trip coming up you've got your own family commitments you've got things you're planning for that will happen once we have a little bit of uh Space, space though yeah. exactly it's about recognizing okay gosh i went through that and that week probably isn't sustainable it could be that couldn't have been prevented at the same time the more that you continue to develop your self-awareness and to develop that groundedness the training happens really outside of the crisis so people often think i need to get better at handling that crisis but they think they need to get better at handling it in that moment. No, that's like a runner trying to get better at winning the gold medal on competition day. It doesn't happen that way. It's all the months yeah, cor- around it. Corny phrase in my head is like, oh, we, we bleed in training so we don't die in battle or something, something yeah, I like silly that. like that. Totally. But, well, <laughs> totally. we can trademark it. But yeah, I, I can be incredibly uh, corny. So I like that. I'm going to use that. We bleed in battles. So we don't, we bleed in training so we don't die in battle. Yeah. And I, I, I can completely see that. So for example, this week, if you were <clears throat> trying to coach me to be more open to some of the things that I need to be doing, I'm too flat out to have the bandwidth to do it. Yeah. Whereas when it's, calmer more level of course i can look at the processes and activities that i'm doing and think this could change this could change equally i do check in with myself each morning and each night with my journal Mm -hmm. um and all the things that i'm writing are mostly positive because i'm loving the activities that i'm doing yeah i probably just got them turned up a little bit too much yeah equally i quite often play golf on a saturday morning and i've cancelled that for this saturday because i know that while I'm, i'm not very good at having a lion getting up and getting to the golf course for half past seven in the morning and getting warmed up and then playing for for three hours is probably going to be more than my capacity can take at this moment in time yes and while that's a leisure activity there's still a strain that comes with that Mm -hmm. and recognizing that during this madness is important for me as well and Mm -hmm. i don't think previous versions of me would have done that and it would be much closer to burnout because i would have just kept going foot to the floor even though as i say that's a leisure activity there is still Mm -hmm. a a commitment to that in the same way that sometimes you might get offered a ticket to go and see the football live but you know that that means the hour travel either side and you know what that means in terms of uh, like mm-hmm. within your day so or could i just watch the football with a friend on television mm-hmm. uh, that's a really uh, glove example but i'm trying my best to illustrate that sometimes you do need to take the foot off the gas both within your work activities but also within the kind of social stuff as well whenever a race car driver is going around a course he doesn't have his foot full down on the pedal the entire way around. And we often think that we need to be going at 100 miles an hour every day. And it's about seeing there is that nuance of times that we take our foot off the pedal and we apply the brake and the times that then we floor it and catch as much speed as we can. It comes from self-awareness. Everything you're talking about, recognizing your own psychological and emotional needs and physical needs is self-awareness. And the more that we're present and we develop that self-awareness, the more we have this accuracy of vision because thoughts and emotions begin to cloud our vision. But the more present we are, the less we are living in our heads and and the more that we are seeing reality as it is. When we have accuracy of vision, we have a sensitivity of response and it comes naturally. You begin to naturally intuit what it is that you need. If I am going to pick up this bottle, it takes a certain amount of pressure for me to lift the bottle up. If I want to lift up the cap, it's going to take a different amount. But I don't need to think about it. I'm just intuitively applying the right amount of pressure because I have this accuracy of vision and proprioception. The more we can begin to be open to that, the more that we'll see it's not about having a strict blanket rule of what we must do or not do. And you get people on 
either end of the spectrum. You get some people that say, no, I must do this every day of every week. And it could be training or it could be a leisure activity or it could be something else. And you get other people say, no, 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 I can't. I don't have time for training. There's a middle path. And the Buddhists would call it, there's a middle path where we're not at this extreme of indulgence or extreme of negation, but we're finding what it is that can nourish you or support you to be the best version of you in that moment is this where the term balance and sustainability almost overlap in terms of we're talking about a balanced sustainable approach that can be maintained and balance has become a bit of a dirty word on social media i've i've, I've seen yeah. recent times but i prefer sustainability and it's a term i've heard you yes. use before as well i think of it as a pendulum if you hold a pendulum at 45 degrees at one angle and let it go it'll swing exactly to the 45 degrees and the opposite and often that's what we're continually doing we swing one way and then we swing another we're in one relationship where we give up all our boundaries and we're trying to appease our partner all the time and then we switch the other way and we become too rigid and self-focused and we're not going to give anything up but a pendulum can rest eternally whenever it's still and whenever it there is alignment and so for all of us it's it's continually check in again what that what the mind will say is okay there's a certain blueprint or protocol that i need to figure out what that is and then i've got balance but we're missing the point again it's it's, it's ever changing you can't step into the same river twice life is continually flowing so your balance and sustainability will have different gradations will have different changes depending on your age the time of your life who's in your life what your responsibilities are so it's not about trying to crack this code and then you have it figured out for the rest of your life it's just continually being present and continually being open to okay what are the parts which are maybe have dropped out of my life oh do you know i've not seen my friends in the last couple of months and another time it could be gosh i've actually not gone on a date night with my partner in a couple of months i'm not applying myself in work in the way that i was six months ago or i'm now pushing everything into work and i can see that my health is beginning to suffer it's a continual dance and so you'll never have it you can only just grow through it and work with it and when we let go of this idea of having to have all the answers the answers will come to you in that present moment one of the biggest skills I've developed as a host is asking a question that the listeners may be thinking about through their AirPods mm. or through their car stereo. And when we're thinking about that pendulum analogy and that stillness in the middle, my question and one that maybe a lot of people have is how can we, tr what exercises or frameworks can we use to try and find that stillness a little bit more often? Slow down. So it's very difficult to see where we are when we're traveling 120 miles an hour because everything's just going past the blink of an eye. Blaise Pascal, the French philosopher said, and I'm going to butcher it, but he said along the lines of all of humanity's suffering arises from mankind's inability to sit quietly alone in a room. If we can begin to slow down a little and rather than just charge, charge ahead and create a bit more space, this can only come with space. You need space. Space has probably been my biggest theme for this year because there have been different events that have happened recently that have taken up a huge amount of cognitive real estate and emotional energy and the practical operational situations i need to deal with and what i realized was i was constantly doing and what i had to do was find a way to create more space for me where i have that space where i can then breathe and allow to see whatever comes up will come up and it will come up for you you don't need to figure it out people are often trying to determine with their mind how they do something but actually, if you slow down and create the conditions for you to be able to hear what you need to work on, it will come to you. You'll begin to see it. 
you won't try and it's not like a math equation that you'll sit down and put all the numbers in. It's and not then, a formula. That's it's not a formula. Yeah. It'll it, it'll come to you. You'll just begin to realize you'll have an insight. So from awareness, which we need to create space for, from awareness will arise an insight. From an insight, it drives change automatically. So it can help to now for me to create that space in my career, I had to put different uh changes in motion that took three four months so i recognized because i had a structure we all have structures in our life and even although i work independently i'd created a structure in terms of when i see my clients and how often and i had to begin to think about how can i create time and space and it took a number of months and i'm beginning to experience it now and then of course other things come into life and you have to remember to when to say no and when to say yes but when you create that space you'll begin to feel and one thing that people could maybe begin to do is just notice how, when they're living in their heads or notice whenever they're connected to what they feel the more we can begin to connect to what we feel and if there is any what of you would probably think of as a negative emotion any anger any hurt any resentment it means there's something to look at within you and so the, our emotions then become indicators or signs there's something to look at here. Now, if you don't have the tools on your own right now, it can really help to work with someone. And it could be to work with a coach or work with a therapist or begin to, if that isn't a possibility, listen to some, to some podcasts or, or read some books on, it could be on awareness or on mindfulness or on, or on the mind or on trauma or on healing or on, on anything that they have an inkling might be going on here. Like, are there any books or podcast you'd recommend apart from this one of course yeah of course um <clears throat> i certainly found that reading the power of now was helpful for me and i've told the story many times on the podcast but for your benefit uh, aria i tried to read it when i was at university when i was 21 yeah and it meant nothing to me <laughs> yeah, because totally. i felt like i was present i was doing things i wanted to do when i wanted to do them but when i entered the working world and i had 40 to 50 hours a week taken up lots of travel yeah all my training on top of that all my socializing i felt that i wasn't as present as i used to be mm -hmm. so by reading that book at the right time for me at a time where i was feeling a bit more rushed and a bit less dare i say it zen mm -hmm. then it spoke to me on a much deeper level so that book was yeah. much more helpful for me when i needed it rather than when i didn't need it and i yeah. definitely think that's the case for lots of books that you read over the years you, you'll maybe find it at the right moment and, and we were speaking about different podcasts that people have maybe sent yeah. me messages about over the years in the, in the archive and I'll, somebody will say to me oh i listened back to episode 31 on sobriety because the first time i listened to it i didn't think mm -hmm. i would need to take a break from alcohol or need to mm -hmm. choose when i drank more strategically but now that really means something to me totally. and it's the same for many different topics certainly including mindfulness yeah. sometimes it comes at the wrong time so somebody might be listening to this today and think I understand what they're talking about, but that's not something that's necessarily that I yeah. need to work on. But then they might in six, in six months time think, wow, do you know what? That gentleman that Colin was talking to, I really feel that at the moment. My yeah. emotions are out of control. I'm, not, yeah. I, I, I'm feeling this anger that yeah. I don't know where it's coming from. Yeah. Power of Now was, I had the same experience, listened to it the first, I think I listened to it the first time and it didn't connect and then returned to it and it did. Uh, a huge uh, book for me was Awareness by Anthony DeMello. And so that was a, a series of talks which they compiled and put into uh, into a book format. But I, I definitely recommend the audible version because he's, he's got this, uh, this voice and sense of humor that comes through it, which is very powerful. Or The Untethered Soul by Michael Singer. And then, yeah, po podcasts that people enjoy. You know, we've talked about Modern Wisdom, Diary of a CEO. There's, you know, Jordan Peterson for some people. They're very explorative to. discussions as well, which yeah. I think is extremely important. And we again, we were talking quite a lot about Modern Wisdom on, on, on the way in because of Chris, who he is to me and how supportive he's been mm -hmm. uh, in terms of for this show and how much of a role model he's been. But when I was quote unquote just a listener to modern wisdom in the very early days before it was the kind of behemoth it is now i was making sure i was listening to one or two of those a week just to open my mind up to yeah. other things because they would have topics that i'd never 
even considered but because i had faith in the host mm -hmm. i was willing to listen in and mm -hmm. it kind of broadens your horizons almost by stealth which yeah. is really important and i guess that links to um carl dweck's book mindset where i try mm -hmm. and have a an, a growth mindset and an open mm -hmm. mindset to learning and expertise in the same way i was saying some of the language you were using when we first started talking 2020 or 2019 colin would have struggled more to mm -hmm. be open to it but by being more open to different conversations and different people and understanding that you're to use a kind of karate term or a martial arts term always a white belt mm. that's a really healthy approach to take particularly when you sit across from somebody who's lived a different experience from you who has learned different things than you and can bring a different perspective and expertise to things mm -hmm. and recognizing that it's a continual process like you're saying of growth and evolution as soon as we think we're there we're fucked <laughs> that's when life's going to come in and say you think you've got it, you don't. As soon as we come to any conclusion, all understanding ceases. Is that like a complacency thing? Complacency, yes. And the fact that once we've made a conclusion, we stop trying to understand because we think we know. So even in life, we make all these conclusions that we don't appreciate. We come to the conclusion that we know who our partner is. Oh, I've known my partner for five years or 10 or 15. I know who they are. This person in front of you is continually growing and changing. And if we do not stay present and begin to try and see with fresh eyes, we'll be holding an old image in front of us and we won't be seeing the person in front of us. And that's when people begin to grow apart too. And so like you were saying, it's that beginner's mind, it's that con continually being a white belt, it's seeing that, yes we're growing and absolutely it's important to look back and see how far we've come on a psychological level or a material level or a career level and see the way that things have grown whilst appreciating and they will continue to grow and so every moment you are where you need to be it's as if you are you're complete but you're still growing it's like the oak tree seed as a seed it's complete and it's still growing and whenever it's you know a small plant, it's complete in itself. It, it's not lacking anything, but it's still growing. I think that links to a lot of the clients that you work with who, if you looked again externally, their achievements are significant, whether it's as a CEO, an actor, a, 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 a sports professional. What are kind of the main things that they're coming and asking you about if they are complete in one domain, but maybe not in others? Often what I've found is that an individual can focus incredibly diligently and powerfully on their career. And like you're saying, are achieving phenomenal accolades or, or developments or creations in the work that they do. If though the mind is ruling, which often it tends to do because a powerful mind will create phenomenal constructions we're the hero in our own story a lot of the time aren't we yeah we're always the hero and we're or the, the center or the villain when things are re reversed aren't they i suppose yeah so brilliant people in terms of what we see and we say wow that's brilliant what they've achieved they have very powerful minds and again it's a double-edged sword yes it allows them to create and achieve in ways that are stellar at the same time, because they have a powerful mind, it can often run the show. And so a lot of the work can be seen when the mind is so focused on, on trying to achieve that that's where all our attention is going. And there will be another part of our life, which is beginning to suffer. So it could be our relationships are suffering and there's a loss of intimacy and you wake up one day and your wife is, or your husband is someone who seems like your companion but not your lover anymore. It's your best friend and a great co-parent, but not the person that you feel a deep emotional connection with. Or there's been an experience of adultery and betrayal, and either you're grappling with the actions that you've taken in terms of being unfaithful, or you're the person that's experiencing it and you're trying to move through it. Or it's a divorce, or is that, like we talked about earlier, waking up and feeling like, do you know, it is amazing what I have and this path I've been on but it doesn't feel like I ever consciously, intentionally set out on this path. It was like 
rolling a, a stone down a hill when I was 19 and it's just picking up speed and picking up grass around it. It's built into this huge, huge structure. But is this what I truly feel aligned with? And is there more? Like, is there more than just the money I'm bringing in? Is there something else for me? So it's, it's beginning to create a space where the individual can begin to explore this and I will sometimes be a mirror or uh, a person who can provide another perspective or to ask you to stand in a different part of the room to see the situation from a different angle and to give insights into the way that the mind works because the mind whether or not you have a hundred billion in your bank or you have nothing operates in the same way and it, and it follows the same rules and so the more that we can understand that the more that we can have awareness of how this machine works so then we can begin to in a way take that control of our approach that we take and the actions that we take it's fascinating because like you say you might be talking to somebody who has built something colossal from scratch and yeah. by all metrics it's been a success and at times perhaps during that journey they have felt aligned but that might change and that's what prompts a conversation with somebody like yourself or coaching or mentoring from somebody like yourself and then from there i wonder you said providing like the mirror situation or providing a different perspective or asking them to leave themselves and look from another angle mm -hmm. what are some of the other exercises that they can maybe use to explore that nagging feeling that they're not following their true self or their true purpose well just before i answer that i think that's a brilliant point to see that we can create something which the world admires and we can be aligned in terms of our intention and our product at some point what i've come to see is that if you go off course despite how big or how impressive what you've created is if you feel as though you've moved away from your integrity or your values or who you are in order to achieve it i've never seen contentment or fulfillment and you know of individuals who you couldn't imagine they wouldn't be proud of what they have and of the company which can be you know global and imp even impacting positively millions of people's lives but if they're not happy with what they set out to do and stay close to who they are it's a road to misery and it goes back to that quote by royal robbins who i often quote who was a pioneer in the rock climbing world and he was the the first to do an ascent in yosemite but without hammering pistons into the structure the surface of the mountain because he wanted to preserve its natural beauty and he said getting to the top is nothing the way you do it is everything and if we can just come back to the way that we're doing something that's where the peace lies that's where that sense of feeling okay lies we talked about it in the car there's certain individuals that you wouldn't have on this podcast because it doesn't align with your integrity there's certain sponsorship deals that you wouldn't take because you don't believe in the product and that's staying close to integrity and on the surface that might seem like it'll take me longer that in itself is debatable but let's just say let's go with that and say it does take you longer whether you achieve what you want to achieve when you're 34 or 37 if you do it in a way where there's peace and you can rest your head at the end of the night and you can wake up the next day and there's there's this clearness within you you're enjoying life you're living life you're building life like it'll, it'll never end so the the journey the day that we're going through it's infinitely more important than what we may or may not achieve in 10 years time amazing and thank you for sharing that particular example because clearly i can relate to it because it's something that we've talked about but i think a lot of people who have been with me on the journey of scaling the podcast can see that i've chosen not to yeah. maybe just chase virality through something particularly controversial or yeah. something a bit sensationalist that didn't quite meet within my value set and there's always temptation to 
straight from that path because of course there is you see another podcast yeah. have somebody on and you know that it'll guarantee you 10,000 downloads which is exciting and it might make get some new listeners and you hope that they stay for the quote unquote real stuff mm-hmm. and the stuff that you really care about but mm-hmm. if you always just create the stuff that you care about then at least I can look myself in the mirror and feel pleased with the efforts mm-hmm. that I'm putting in and, and, the, and the path that I'm on and as you say if it takes longer at least I'm doing it in the way that yeah. I'm happy with your light and for me lightness is huge life will bring you enough challenges to your own life that will feel heavy and so as much as possible if we can have a lightness of spirit and a lightness of heart and a lightness of mind we're so much more agile we'll be able to adapt and going back to the point of will it take longer or will it not i've come to see that the more that an individual is aligned with who they are the more authentic they are the more powerful they are your power lies in your true self your true self is being authentic and sincere you see it from the zen buddhists who say the purpose of life is to express your true nature with sincerity you see it in the samurai who have a principle in bushido which is authenticity their resilience their power comes from being authentic and true and so there is something powerful about letting go of the ideas of what you think will bring success and staying true and aligned with your values and what you believe is true and right in this moment if you keep on following what you believe is true and right and what you can feel is true and right everything else will begin to take care of itself for you something interesting that that makes me think about is the position that you come from when doing that and it's easier for for me for example to do that when i'm not in an immediate rush because of necessity because I'm coming from a place of relative abundance in what I'm doing just now in terms of one enjoyment, but two stability and like financial security. Mm -hmm. Whereas I guess if somebody is chasing a result faster through necessity, whether that's mouth to feed or maybe they're driven by particular material desires that they feel that they must achieve by a particular point, then they're far more likely to veer from that path in that moment in time. Yeah. And that's a real concern because if you are coming from that scarcity and that desperation, mm-hmm. then I can see much more easily how you could stray from that level of alignment. Absolutely. And of course, there's a pragmatism to what we're talking about. If you have a partner and two young children, then that may not be the time to not have a steady income and try and create a podcast which is not bringing any income in so naturally it's about awareness is also about being aware of your external circumstances and your external commitments and and the commitments that you want to take on as well as internally whether or not you're staying true to your values and a lot of the time if we're above this breadline of being able to provide for our own needs a lot of that sense of desperation actually comes internally from the mind and you can have an individual which actually has a huge amount but they still are moving from that place of scarcity and desperation and so absolutely external circumstances matter but what's more important is that we're aware of where we're coming from and is the mind driving us from a place of fear and from a place of seeming need and this idea that we have to achieve this by this age i saw that um the kind of three traits of the mo- some of the most hyper successful people it's from like a it's like tiger mum uh, which is all that kind of asian culture where the, yeah. the mother massively pushes the children to achieve massive success and one of the qualities is a feeling of deep ina- inadequacy at all mm-hmm. times mm-hmm. so there's always i must achieve this because then i'll feel whole or i must achieve yeah. this because i'm not good enough yet yeah and that can be a really powerful driver and people can achieve remarkable things which have net positives off the back of it which is admirable in some sense Mm -hmm. but if they never ever feel that level of adequacy and they never feel any form of satisfaction or comfort in Mm -hmm. what they've achieved then it's all sort of for nothing and i guess that would be a type of client that you would quite often speak to who's chased this Mm -hmm. thing because they've got this demon on their shoulder that says aria colin you've not made it yet keep going you're never going to be enough yeah And we can be driven by fear and driven by inadequacy and it can be 
incredibly effective. And you might be able to remember Michael Phelps whenever he won with the five or six Olympic medals. I mean, the world hadn't seen such an achievement. And he had a mental breakdown six months later and attempted suicide, I believe. And I think it's a podcast with... Um, with uh, Is it Tim Ferriss? Tim Ferriss. To? Yeah, yeah. And he talks about it there. And it's that reminder that absolutely fear can drive, but it comes at a cost and it depends what are you willing to pay for that cost. The question I'm more interested in is, can you achieve greatness from a place of wholeness? And I've come to experience that and seen it and witnessed it across the board at the same time too. So you, we, we have a choice about the path that we're going to take. If someone wants to be driven by fear, that is their choice. And I would never step in and say that they shouldn't do that. Do what you like, but just know that it's coming at a cost. And, not, and often I'll start off working with an individual and then they'll come to recognize, I don't want to let it go. The reason often they don't want to let it go is there's a fear that if I let this go, that I'm going to lose my edge and I'm not going to try anymore. There's a study that Jordan Peterson regularly talks about where they have rats in a cage and they've got mm. a, a coil on their, yeah. on their tail and they measure how hard the rat pulls when it's been starved for however long towards the cheese. Yeah. And it pulls very hard because it's hungry. But then they measure how hard the rat will pull when the cheese is in front of it, but the smell of a cat is behind it. And of yeah. course it pulls far harder because not only is it something that it's running towards, but it's mm -hmm. something to run away from. So in that same sense, some of the people that are extremely mm -hmm. successful that you work with, when they've got something that they're working towards, but something that are running away from and pulling away from with ferocious might, yeah. it's actually harder sometimes than when we're only working towards a visionary goal. And mm -hmm. I guess, as you say, can we still achieve greatness when it's coming from a wholesome place? Yeah. I really hope so. <laughs> well, we can look at... It's probably easier to identify from figures such as Mandela or Mother Teresa or Gandhi and often they end up being quite spiritual or taking that hand individuals where they're moving from a place of love. And Naval Ravikant is another, you know, another voice and and uh figure who whose philosophies, you know, are very much aligned with and so it's for the individual to find that path, but then it also begs the question, what is more important to you? If we did have to make a choice, if you did have to make a choice between earning 30% more, but moving from a place of fear and anxiety and insecurity, which will mean that you're on shaky ground and you won't feel content and unsatisfied and earning 30% less, but being content, which one are you going to choose? That's when they need the stillness area that we spoke about on the pendulum to check in with yourself. Mm. And in that moment of calm, when you're not foot to the floor, trying to gain that 30%, assess whether the juice is worth the squeeze. Yeah. And there's a good chance that almost anyone that in their yeah. rational mind and in their calm state would in the stillness would yeah. realize that I'd rather earn 30% less, yeah. but be aligned and not necessarily happier, but more focused on where yeah. I am and content with that position. Cause the irony is <clears throat> people are often striving for the 30% more because they think that will bring stillness and fulfillment and contentment. So we're really, cutting ourselves while trying to heal ourselves it's not it's not going to work and it's so that it's just stepping back and seeing what is what is truly important you know what do you want to stand for what do you want to create in what way do you want to do it what matters most to you and the more you can go back to that the more you're living your life on your terms completely agree you shared a quote and you share a number of brilliant quotes on instagram this one's from robert too and he said trust yourself you survived a lot and you'll survive whatever is coming. What does that mean to you? I've come to experience that you, 
you you can reach a point where you lose so much that you lose the fear of losing and i'm not sure if that sounds depressing or liberating but you will lose the things in life at times that you desperately don't want to lose and that you love and there's nothing you can do to stop that or change that but whenever you move through that in a way there's like a shedding because you begin to see whatever happens I'll be okay I'll find my way through it and being okay doesn't mean it won't be painful it will be but there's nothing that anyone can come and do or take away from you anymore which can take away your peace because if you can find a, a way through this life of connecting to that peace within you and knowing that that's yours and no one can take that away everything else becomes less integral to your happiness so then you don't need anything and you can hold things more lightly and i believe that whenever you when you don't need something then you can love it more fully where there's need there's no love and where there's love there's no need and so the biggest gift that any of us can give to the world is actually focusing on our own self and developing and cultivating that sense of groundedness and connecting to your inner power and connecting to your ability to forgive and your ability to let go of the past and your ability to allow your emotions to flow through you so they don't stay there your ability to recognize what's important your ability to be present your ability to protect yourself whenever you need to create time for yourself your ability to do what you need to do in order to stay health healthy physically and emotionally and mentally and your ability to essentially heal yourself when you've been through different wounds and different traumas that you've experienced and your ability to love yourself in that way the more that if we all begin to do more of that to really cultivate then that depth of roots the more that the tree can withstand and the more that the tree can grow which will give fruits and flowers to the people around you and so part of it is trusting yourself trusting that everything you need is within you and every time I work with a client or have a conversation with a good friend or a conversation with someone I've just met what always comes up is through a conversation they had the answers within them already I don't give any answers to any of my clients they have all the answers and they have all the qualities and they have all the values and they have all the power within them that they need already but along the way we forget that or we miss that and we begin to believe in illusion and this path is about going back to that and seeing that that trust within yourself you have everything you need and life will be beautiful but it also will be brutal but the more that you can trust yourself and the more that you experience in a way the more you begin to see that one all will be well two life will continually go on and three it's never the end of the story this might be a difficult chapter but whatever you're going through there'll be more love there'll be more fulfillment there'll be more happiness there'll be more joy there'll be more gratitude if we stay open and we trust yourself and we recognize that we will find our way through this that was amazing <laughs> no no uh, amazing aria and <laughs> within that you said that your clients and the people you have conversations with bring the answers themselves because and in my belief it's because of the space and framework and understanding you give them and some of the analogies you use particularly throughout this conversation around the tree and around storms and the boat my mind is just going so many places to try and understand what that means for me well of course still being within yeah, this conversation yeah, yeah. and that tree piece for me is like you said in terms of it providing fruit and flowers for those around you that's amazing and again we joked about being corny earlier the whole put your gas mask on first on the plane or you can't yeah. pour from an empty cup these things 
people may dismiss them as corny or cliche, yeah. but there's a reason that they are said Co common sense is not often common practice, yeah. but they are common sense indeed. Yeah. And when I'm thinking about that tree and I think about things you said about storms or the, or, or, or the boat as well, if we can be as resilient as possible through serving ourselves first, mm -hmm. then of course, then we can give on to others and deal with the different hardships that come our way and be a strong figure within our family, within our friendship group, within our partnerships and relationships. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the most poignant things that you've that we've discussed today is understanding that we must mm -hmm. armor ourselves for what is to come because come mm -hmm. it will as I'm, I'm sure you've said before too completely and in what, what i'm hearing with what you're saying is that in order to be selfless we have to focus on the self and it seems like an oxymoron or a contradiction but there's a spiritual level to this in that our self at our core there is awareness so we've talked about how the mind has a voice and it will create thoughts and it will create emotions we are the experiencer of the emotions and we're the observer of the thoughts that is consciousness so essentially we're this field of consciousness consciousness is is everywhere the way i think about it it's a little, little bit like consciousness is the sky now you've got sky the sky over glasgow and you've got the sky over london and you've got different weather patterns it's all though just sky we just have this structure that correlates to that particular area or it's like having a basin of water and you take a cup and you put it in upside down and the water fills up and you've got all these different cups. The water is consciousness. It's all just water, but it's within a certain container. So our consciousness is in this container of my body and within the container of your body, but it's all just consciousness. I saw the body of someone who was very, very dear to me and I could see it changed so much for me because I could see that that person's spirit wasn't in that body anymore. The body was a container, but the person that I knew and love wasn't there. The spirit wasn't there. If we're all spirit, when we focus on self and we're moving from self, we're moving from consciousness, we're moving from spirit that's connected with everything else. So if we, truly begin to live from that place we begin to see if i harm harm you colin i'm harming myself if i harm or do something which creates destruction for other people intentionally i'm harming myself if i harm myself i'm harming others you know if, even if we look at someone who does harm themselves the people around them suffer too so the more that we can focus on self because the essence of our self is love the essence of ourself is peace and compassion and, and wisdom. When we move from a place of what is true and right for you, you will benefit the people around you. You can't not because you'll be moving from a place where you're being more empathetic, you're being more understanding. You've got more patience, you've got more love, you've got more energy. Everyone around you are going to reap all these rewards. Positive so, ripple effect. Completely, completely. So it's our... We think we have a duty to serve others. We have a duty to serve others through serving ourselves. But it has to start there. It has to start there. And the more that you follow that path, the more that you see it's the biggest gift you can give to your partner, your brother, your sister, your mom, your dad. When you're happy and you're secure and you're feeling grounded and you're feeling good about your life and you're like, Do you know, I fucking love my life. And you have this energy which vibrates and the people around you love it too. And you're being creative and you're inspiring creative possibilities within other people. That's when we have the biggest positive impact. So just like you're saying, it starts with focusing on yourself. Yeah, that, that, that's incredible. And I, I guess one of the questions that I was really keen to ask you was, how has this developed over time? Because you said Aria, even five years ago, wouldn't have been able to use some of this language. And I know that this language and this approach has been put to the test throughout the last number mm -hmm. of years as well but how has that developed over time 
in the same way that a plant grows over time, it just grows. If we don't interrupt the natural course of nature, it just continues to grow. There's the, the one principle of the universe and this world is evolution. Life just goes on and it continues to evolve. And so part of it, to kind of answer your question more directly, is just having an openness that we don't have all the answers and have an openness and a willingness to see that our lives and our course and our development is a co-creation. It's a co-creation with you and life. And the, where people go wrong is that either they think that they're in control 100% and then they become obsessive and, and controlling and then there's this friction because they're constantly fighting life is like a battle that they're constantly having to push through and forge and get through and it's all about force or they give up and they say what will be what's will be they just life. surrender okay yeah and the surrender we, we we can bring in but it's they don't take any responsibility for the co-creation and they just wait and then life will give them opportunities, but they're not jumping on any of them because they're thinking it will happen for them. But it's a bit like the idea, there's no one coming to save you, <laughs> right? It's your life, it's, it's going to be us, but, but it's a co-creation. This co-creation was just being open and seeing that it's a willingness to be wrong and it's a willingness to learn and it's a willingness to grow. And that's why there's an external journey and the internal journey, the external journey, money, status, fame, credibility, accolades. Is that important? Absolutely. Should you progress in it? Definitely. Should you dedicate time and energy to it? 100%. The internal journey, though, internally growing in terms of, like you talked about, self-awareness, resilience, self-understanding, compassion, love, having more groundedness, having more security, having more faith in yourself, believing in yourself, trusting yourself. Should we go on this journey to yes so if we stay open to that journey if we begin to see its value and importance and see that actually this stuff is gold like absolute gold and i am willing life guide me teach me i will work with you and keep on connecting back to your intuition or connecting to what you feel there's like an internal radar within all of us and the more we can be in tune with that and notice it's a little bit like when you meet someone and they seem really lovely and they seem charismatic, but there's something about them that you just internally doesn't feel right. Like there's a sense there. It's beginning to trust these different, different sort of like intuitive feelings about what's right for you. You can have different options and there's one that you just gravitate towards. And even although other people might say, no, 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 you should definitely take that course of action. There's something about that that doesn't seem right. And this, that does feel aligned. The more we can begin to build up that intuitive feeling, and I know it's quite a ethereal concept, but it's just beginning to sort of like sink in. I think of it as either I can be in my head or I can sink down into my heart or my soul and just begin to sit and does it feel right? Does it feel aligned or does it feel off? If it doesn't feel off, you can assume that it's aligned. If we can continue and to see the value in that, whatever you want to call it, psychological, emotional, spiritual journey, life will work through you you won't have to try because it's not about trying it will just do i think it's yoda now we're bringing in right <laughs> do not try something like that do not yeah when he's speaking to luke skywalker yeah, yeah. Uh, what did he say i can't get the quite quote yeah. no but i know exactly where yeah. you're going with that within that internal piece as well resilience openness openness links to vulnerability and your ability to be vulnerable in a very public setting was something that drew me to you and made me feel connected to you not just as a potential guest but as a man what's enabled you to be vulnerable so publicly it's funny actually a friend of mine who i became friends with quite recently we were, we were talking about it and we were discussing the difference between potentially a topic that i wouldn't talk about or a topic that i would and what we identified was, and I was saying to him, well, with that situation, there was no shame. I wasn't holding any shame on it. 
And he was like, really? <laughs> He's like, dude, that would have been an experience that would have created the most amount of shame in terms of, and I should probably explain, uh, I talked about in the diary of a CEO with Steve Bartlett, uh, when my wife had an affair and told me one day that she was pregnant with his child. And I go through the experience, but also the, the lessons and the principles I use to move through that to find a place of peace and find a place of forgiveness and to find the ability for you to love again as well which is yeah. fundamental I guess completely completely and so I say with that there was no shame so a lot of it's beginning to also let go of the past and let go of resentment and let go of anger and let go of shame and that's in a way, if we're going to surrender to anything, that's what we should surrender to. We should, it's a letting go. Everything's a letting go. If we continually let go, being present is letting go. It's letting go of your mind's thoughts. It's letting go of your mind's emotions. When we let go of everything, then there's just awareness. So it's continually letting go. Letting go of the idea that, like we talked about before, I have to do this by the age of that. Letting go of the idea of what it even it means to be successful from an external point of view, letting go of people's expectations on us, letting go of the pressure to fit in and to be a certain way. We continually let go. The more we let go, the more that then there are no blocks. And so what is within us will naturally come through. Your natural true self will be expressed. You'll just be expressing more truthfully and more authentically. When you express more truthfully and more authentically, you're more powerful. And so then we're co-creating. You mentioned the emotion of shame, but as a younger man, you said anger would come out before you were more aligned the way you yeah. are now. A situation like the one you encountered with your ex-wife, mm -hmm. anger is the immediate emotion that springs to mind for many people when they experience yeah. something like that. How do you silence that anger and move forward so it's not about silencing the anger but it's about experiencing the anger without acting from the anger now if you have a human brain you will have human emotions anger is often linked to the ego or the egoic mind so the overwhelming emotion was sadness. There were absolutely elements of anger, but that was more linked to my ego. How could she do this to me? This was my wife, my house. This was that ownership piece, the okay. ownership piece. <clears throat> Interesting. Even now what I'm experiencing is, I'm dealing with different moments of anger, which are coming into my life now, which I never would have expected. And I'm beginning to even understand that piece. Where is that coming from? And so the journey continually evolves and we can reach a place of peace and then life will find another way of triggering you. It's life's way of telling you what you need to work on. So if we're getting feelings of anger or sadness, it's life's way of saying there's something here for you to look at, to try and heal. And some of the anger which I'm experiencing now is whenever I'm recognizing that I'm feeling that I am thinking that someone else is taking advantage of my understanding nature. And that came from my past of my relationship with my ex-wife where there was a part of me that felt like my kindness had been taken advantage of the truth is though i didn't have boundaries and i didn't i confused kindness with having boundaries of what i of how much to give and whether or not i'm giving from a place of love or giving from a place of fear you gave this example with the pendulum and um, no boundaries at all all totally. the way through to being totally shut off and totally. difficult and, un and inflexible, totally. which is a terrible place to be, but both places are a bad place to be. Totally. So I'm recognizing that my pendulum swung and I'm doing work now for me to work on. Okay, slow down. Let's try and see reality. And I'm trying to recognize now. And we're talking about even the last couple of weeks. So <laughs> we're, we're, we're forever growing, as you said. We're forever growing. This, yeah. Totally. So I'm seeing that, gosh, my ego is getting 
hurt because it feels taken advantage of and now it's coming in strong and coming in and thinking it's being strong and saying no this is not right you should not think of the situation this way or or act this way or feel this way but then there's no love and understanding and it creates more conflict so it's seeing that beneath the anger there's vulnerability and vulnerability is the ability to be hurt and so it takes that willingness to explore that to begin to try and keep on healing ourselves and to stay open and to recognize that yes there is the possibility of of being hurt but what i found at the same time is the more you hear, heal yourself the more that the more that you let go of the fear of being hurt too I, I guess that answers that part where i was asking about being able to love again after hurt yeah. it's the openness to yes this may not work out the way that i would idealize but i'm open to the experience because it's likely that it is worth it yeah and if it does go wrong and it, i do get hurt that is part of my journey that i'm going to go on inevitably completely so i've been i'm in an amazing beautiful relationship now with this beautiful girl inside and out and i'm working i'm working through that and seeing that you know at the beginning of the relationship i'd done all the healing that i believe i could have done on my own yeah you know, i'm at peace i've forgiven like genuinely forgiven my ex-wife and her partner like i send them love i really wish them the best it's it's the best thing that ever happened to me i love my life now i would not go back and change it and then going into a new relationship seeing that there are wounds which you pick up and then your mind's like <laughs> aria protect yourself like just just protect yourself <clears throat> and then so the mind wants to protect you by then keeping you close so i had to really recognize that and 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 consciously intentionally recognize and share with my partner do you know this is me even moving to that place of love and, and sharing for the first time that i love you or or continuing to be open it's more challenging for me now than it was 10 years ago but when you share with that openness if the other person is open and loving too they'll say you know i totally get it like I, I completely understand and she's been phenomenal in saying look based on what's happened i think you know you're doing amazingly and i think that it's natural that you'll feel that way so sometimes even what i'm saying is even someone who works in this i'm still continually working through this like all of it and it's still helps me whenever there are times when my mind is judging myself for experiencing fear and insecurity and recognizing the times where my partner is helped by saying it's okay for you to feel this and then i remember do you know this is what i need to give myself it's just it's reteaching okay. these lessons that you already know but they're always happening and i think as you said during the conversation these experiences you've had and these continued experiences you have put you in an excellent position to understand empathize and mm -hmm. support clients with similar if not the same yeah. situations yeah the content in a way doesn't matter anytime i work with a client the content it could be something that's happened with their wife or it could be something that's happened at work it doesn't matter because the content is what allows you to see where the work is and where the healing is and where the growth is and where there are deeper levels of understanding that can support you so i bring in what happens within my life all the time because and even what's happening within that week or that day will be an insight for me to understand better and to share a certain perspective and really what i'm doing is often drawing on what i've experienced and then taking my ex mind's experience and then sharing that and seeing if it is reflected and all and i'd say people can connect to it because they say totally that's what i'm thinking or that's what i'm feeling or that's what i'm doing or that's the trap that we're getting caught up in where i feel like she's being inappropriate and then i'm reacting to her 
inappropriate feelings and then she's feeling misheard and then she's attacking me and then I'm defending myself and attacking her and we're getting caught up in this like vicious cycle and I can break that down because I've been there <laughs> you know, I, because I've done that to you and I've got caught up in that trap you've run that race and you understand I've run what that it feels race, like yeah and I'm still running the race and still things that I'm seeing and there's still so it's it's continual it's when you let go of the idea of having to ever be there there is nowhere to be there's nowhere to go there's just now and if we just keep on coming back and the more that even this week with different parts that I'm going through what I has come to me this week is if we keep on coming back to the now in this moment and letting go of everything else there is still a sense of peace which will give you that groundedness to be able to deal with the difficult conversations to be able to to be able to create space for someone else when they're attacking you and for you to rather than defend to actually listen and to seek to understand so how are you feeling how are you seeing me right now how are you seeing our relationship what do you feel like is happening and creating space for that and understanding and then for them to be able to share that and you to be able to hold that and also share what you're feeling and what you're experiencing and where it might be different and you find a way through it together but it only comes the more that we do this inner work the more that we focus on being present and feeling the power of that groundedness wow i mean i feel like i've learned so much from this conversation and i'm sure the listeners have as well and i think we could go on for yeah. another however long we've been together and i'm sure we will do it at some point again in the future but if listeners want to continue the conversation with you where should they head towards well you just you'll put the links in the yeah, yeah in the i'd say from this monday actually i'm not sure when the show's coming out but i'm gonna be posting more on youtube and on socials on instagram and tiktok so, so, so. instagram and youtube will be linked to yeah. the show notes thank you so much Perfect. aria thank and you thank you so much for this time and this space and you have a huge amount of wisdom and insight and i love the way that you pull things together particularly you know i can move into this realm where it might feel a little bit spiritual or deep and you find a way to, to relate it to all that depth to probably different phrases and understandings that people can connect to i think that's a lovely bridge to well, thank you for that, Ari. It's lots of lots of practice with lots of different yeah, wise yeah, yeah. guests, and awesome. uh, it certainly paid off. But thank you so much, and thank you to you, the listener. I'll be back to speak to you all again very, very soon. <laughs>